With a shared enthusiasm for the duo medium, James and Foti formed the Portland Guitar Duo in 1999. They've performed in numerous venues throughout the United States as a duo team, as soloists with chamber ensembles, and in appearances on radio and television. The Portland Guitar Duo focuses on historical interpretation and performs on a number of instruments from the guitar and lute families, such as Renaissance, Baroque lutes, and Mandora, Baroque guitars, Romantic guitars of the 1800s, modern classical guitars, and 10-string guitars. In addition to their own transcriptions, two Northwest composers, Matt Doran and Rebecca Oswald, have written works for the duo. The Portland Guitar Duo plays concerts and festive events and plays at libraries. Like this, please welcome the Portland Guitar Duo. Um, so today we'll do a presentation on the history of the guitar. Um, it's going to be a very short presentation because this instrument has a very rich history, um, as, as well as some of the history of the loop. Uh, so we hope that you will um, gain something from this. Um, and again, the, the, the guitar is an instrument that is undergoing still development. Um, it, it's an instrument that is developing. We can talk about that a little later. Um, but we'll start with um, one of the first instruments in European history, music history, the lute. And this is an important instrument. Um, so the lute came primarily to Spain through the Moors, um, the Moors occupation of Spain about 700 to 1100 um, or so. And uh, they brought the oud with them. The Moors brought the oud, and the Europeans took the oud and adopted it to their own music. So one of the first things that they did, um, and we're talking about Spain and Italy here, they tied gut frets. So the oud is a, an instrument without frets. Um, so they tied gut frets, and that uh, brought it more into the harmonic um, tradition of Western music. And uh, the first, the woods had about four double strings, we call them courses. Um, and the first lutes had about four to five double double strings as well. They were played with a plectrum, just as the wood is still played with a plectrum. Um, as the music got more complicated and intricate, they started adding bass strings to these instruments. So the instrument that I have with me is an eight course Renaissance lute. Uh, the Baroque lutes go up to 11 and 13 courses, and the theorbos that are used for accompaniment uh, can go all the way up to 14 courses. So they're big instruments. Um, and so this particular instrument has, is kind of tuned like a guitar, pretty much, uh, except the third course uh, is a little different. So I will play a little Italian piece for you. Um, Renaissance music was primarily big in Spain, Italy, somewhat in France, and then uh, late Renaissance is um, in, in England with Dolan, the musical Dolan. So I'll play a little um, Italian piece to start, to start our music. It's called uh, Se io m'accordo ben mio con altro amante. Uh, which translate, I become aware, my darling, of another lover. <laughs> Thank you. 
So from the lute, we have the vihuela. And the vihuela uh, is the core predecessor of the guitar. It resigned in Spain for a, at least two centuries, even when the uh, lute uh, was developing. Uh, uh, the vihuela stayed in Spain. It was the primary instrument. Uh, it has six strings, um, and there are also courses, double course, except for the high E, which is the melody string, um, as the lute as well. Uh, and the, there was a few different ways that they were playing the vihuela. Uh, first one was the vihuela de arco, which was bowed, so they also bowed the vihuela as well. It was the vihuela de mano, which was plucked, as I will play it today, and the vihuela uh, de penola, which was a plectrum with a feather plectrum, as the oud as well. Um, it also has tied guts uh, for the frets as well. Uh, the vihuela comes in all different sizes. This is a pretty large vihuela. A lot of vihuelas are much smaller, much higher in pitch, but this is going to be a much darker tone. Uh, today, I would like to play a piece called Guardame las Vacas, and that's translated in Guard for Me, the Women. It was by Luis de Navarez, very famous vihuelist at that time. And at that time, there were a lot of vihuelists that were composing their own pieces and treaties as far as methods on how to play the instrument. Um, it was a very popular song at that time. Uh, so this is Guardami Las Vacas by Luis de Navarrez. I'd like to perform for you is by Alonzo Madura, another well-established vihuelist that wrote quite a few pieces and treaties on how to play the vihuela. This is going to be a fantasia. When fantasies are, they're basically a free-form composition to um, exhibit the instrumentalist facilities. Uh, so, in its base of the fantasy, it's, it's very um, it's to improv. On it. Uh, so, this is uh, a very famous piece actually on the Vihuela uh, by Alonso Madura. Thank you. 
Uh, so we'll jump one period now. Um, as you can see, every time we do this presentation, we like to um, put certain themes into our into this program. Um, so we did a couple of uh, solos. We'll do one more solo, and then we'll do our duets. Um, we're also uh, focusing on a theme of uh, the dance, uh, the music of Spain, and uh, the idea of transcription. So, and we'll talk, we'll talk along as, as we uh, present these ideas um, in the music. So, the next period is the Baroque period. Um, it covers uh, the, the, the years between roughly 1600 to 1750 in, in music history. And um, the two main instruments were the Baroque lute uh, and the Baroque guitar. Um, we could only fit these instruments in the car. <laughs> Just brought these. We, we, there wasn't enough uh, space for a Baroque lute, which is a big instrument. Um, but we brought a little Baroque guitar. Um, so this instrument uh, was a very, very popular instrument uh, back then. It, um, it, it was relatively easy to play because it has five strings. Um, and a lot of people, you know, playing strumming on it. Um, so they really liked it. It was very popular in the courts. Uh, it was very popular to play all kinds of tunes in it. And uh, with this instrument, we are starting to get into the um, tuning of the guitar. So the the. The tuning of this instrument is just like a guitar. A, D, G, B, D. But you'll notice it's missing the sixth string, right? So it is basically, it's primarily a treble instrument, and our ear has the ability to fill in um, the chords. So, and the, the funny thing about this instrument is that the lowest string here uh, is higher than this string here. So there, there is a reason for that, um, and they they uh, did they used they used to play um, what is called campanellas. So uh, they, it's um, a how would you say that um, consecutive notes on strings um, that sound all together. So think A, B, C, D on different strings, but they sound all together, so they create this um, campanella effect, bells. Um, I will play a piece by Gaspar Sanz, uh, which was, again, a very popular um, Spanish composer. And this particular instrument, again, was very popular in Spain, in France, and um, somewhat in, uh, in Italy, and somewhat in, uh, the northern countries. So Gaspar Sanz was uh, again a, a guitarist, composer. Um, one of the pieces uh, that he wrote is called Folias, which is a piece that's uh, based on certain chord progressions, and then the, the performer can improvise on it. Uh, the music of Gaspar Sanz also became the basis of Rodrigo's concerto for the gentleman. Uh, which was written for Sibob. So, four minutes. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 
grab your lamp of Jesus. So the instruments we'll showcase now um, are the instruments that were used in the Romantic and the Classical period, the 1800s, basically. Um, and the guitar, guitar went uh, an enormous uh, amount of uh, change during that period. So there was, there was a lot of experimentation, um, and this actually now becomes the instrument that will develop into the modern classical guitar. Um, so as you can see, there, there are no more uh, gut frets, no more tight frets, right? They started with metal frets, uh, which is great. Um, also, uh, there are no more courses. The, the guitar becomes a single string instrument now. And uh, we have uh, tuning keys starting to develop, rather than friction picks. So the instruments that we brought today is um, more or less an early example and a later example of the development of, of the guitar in the 1800s. Um, as you can see, the, the fingerboard is, is flush to the neck on this uh, instrument. And on this instrument, now we see the tendency to uh, put the fingerboard on top of the guitar, right? On the top. Um, friction pegs, mechanical tuners, um, and two very, very different bodies, right? Um, the, 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 there was a tremendous amount of experimentation in guitar making at the time, uh, particularly in Italy um, and in France and in Germany. The instruments that we have with us are two copies of the French school. Uh, this particular one is a copy of um, an instrument by La Prevote. It's an 1824 copy. Um, and La Prevote was a very interesting luthier because he was primarily a violin maker. So the back of this instrument is actually uh, carved like a violin. And the only two uh, braces that he has are, are two braces just like kind of a cello or a violin right along the, the top here. Um, this instrument, this is a Lecolt, a very famous French maker, copy of Lecolt by Michael Thames. Um, and uh, this is one of his um, early examples. As Boti mentioned, there is no fingerboard or there is a veneer flush with the body before fingerboards. And he did make fingerboards a little bit later on. But uh, the bracings on this particular uh, style of building are what they call transverse bracings. So all you, he had was a few transverse bars going this way, sometimes they would slant it. And that was it. This is before any band bracing started uh, to came about. Uh, and uh, again, in this, time period, they were very experimental, uh, trying to, uh, there really wasn't anything that luthiers or builders did not try at this time, but, uh, uh, and body shapes and everything. Uh, early Lecolte uh, friction pegs before they went to machines, started machines as well. And a very, very traditional wood uh, with the maple, the tiger maple that's used in violin making. Um, so, a lot of the violin uh, builders did make uh, make guitars as well at this time, uh, uh, and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and this instrument um, has an ebony back, which um, is rather unusual for, for um, instruments, but I always wanted to see what ebony would do. Um, and you will hear how these instruments interact with each other and the differences between these instruments. Um, so we'll play, we'll start with a little piece by um, Fernando Sor, who is again a composer guitarist. Uh, this is a piece called Souvenirs of Russia. Um, and it is primarily a set of variations. So we will play the introduction, which is rather symphonic in nature, so think about that. 
and then the, the main theme, and then four variations.
All right, um, so the next piece we'll play comes uh, a little earlier, uh, very late 1700s or so. Um, this is a piece by um, a keyboardist, and here the idea of transcription comes in. Um, and this is a piece, again, from Spain. Um, it's a harpsichord or clavichord sonata by uh, Antonio Soler. Uh, Soler was a a composer that had studied with Scarlatti when Scarlatti was in Spain. And his music somewhat resembles the music of Scarlatti. Uh, he also puts a lot of um, Spanish flavor in his sonatas. This is a one movement piece, and um, it has been transcribed for two guitars. The, again, the idea of transcription is not something new in music. Um, Bach used uh, used to transcribe mu a musical Vivaldi uh, for his own concertos, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the, again, the transcription, uh, transcriptions uh, work really well for the guitar. Um, and it's a, a chance for us to study the music, you know, piano music of that period, or symphonic music of that period. And, um, translated into our own instruments. Sorry. <laughs>
coming to the main instrument of the day, uh, the modern classical guitar. As you can see, uh, this is a much bigger instrument uh, than the previous ones. Um, the, in the late 1800s, uh, a Spanish uh, luthier called uh, Antonio de Torres uh, started experimenting with um, both size and um, bracing of the guitar. So, and it wasn't only him, Let's, uh, we need to give credit to uh, the Spanish school of Luthery, because uh, they, were, they were experimenting on uh, different things at the time. So, um, as, the, as the instrument becomes bigger, he uh, started building bigger instruments, so there's a lot more tension on the top, um, on, on the bigger scale of the instrument. So the idea is to brace it accordingly so it can withstand the, the tension of the strings. So the idea of the fan bracing now comes to mind. Um, and Torres experimented quite a bit, other Spanish luthiers experimented quite a bit. And now this has become um, the norm of, for these guitars, right? Um, and why we talked about the, this instrument still developing and, and it's an evolution still because a lot of uh, makers today are still experimenting with different ways of bracing the top um, to give this instrument more volume or a different tone um, or things like that, things of that nature. Um, they, luthiers have come up with double tops and lattice bracing um, which again uh, do credit to the guitar. Um, this is again a, an instrument that is um, still finding its voice even today, more or less. Anything to add? To that? Uh, no. You said it quite a bit. Boji and I tend to always play the more traditional. Now it's called old school or classical guitar. So we just prefer the sound. So 
um, the first piece that we'll play on these instruments comes from the late 1800s. Um, it's again Spanish music, mm -hmm. uh, music of Enrique Granados. And we'll play um, all three um, na nationalistic composers of Spain, uh, starting with Granados, then we'll go to Albeniz, and then we'll finish with Falla. Uh, of the three, uh, Granados writes very elegant and eloquent music. And uh, we'll play two of the waltzes um, out of the six of the waltzes poetos, the first and the last.
Isaac Albeniz was, uh, again, primarily a pianist. Um, and he wrote uh, fantastic music for the piano. Uh, the funny thing is that both Granados and Albeniz's music has been extensively transcribed on guitar because they treated the piano as a big guitar. Um, the, the piece that we'll play for you today is uh, a serenada. It's called Granada. Um, and it is a tone poem on the fountains of the gardens of Granada.
And the last piece we'll play for you um, is a piece by Manuel de Falla, uh, who was the modernist of uh, the Spanish school of composers. Um, de Falla uh, wrote the three-cornered hat as a ballet, primarily. Um, and it's the story of a new governor coming into the city who wears the three-cornered hat, which is a symbol of authority. And he sees the miller's wife, um, who is a very beautiful woman, and he wants to spend some time with her. So he is scheming to have the miller, her husband, arrested, thrown in jail, so he can have some time with the beautiful lady. Um, so this is the dance of the miller, and it's, um, it's, it's a faruka, so it comes from the flamenco tradition. Um, and it's primarily a dance uh, danced by men. So uh, this is the miller dancing uh, for his friends, and you'll hear at the end the police is coming to arrest him. <laughs> So with that, with that said, uh, we'd like to thank all of you for coming. Um, if you guys have any questions after we play, please uh, feel free to ask um, or come talk to us. It's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure spending a couple of days here. And um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.